Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ninja Road of the Color Podcast. I'm your host, D. Otley, O T T L E Y. It is Sunday, March 13th. This episode is the Ides of March. We're talking about. Oh, that's a fine. Tournament, John Morant, and other stuff like that. Let's get it started. Enjoy extra sugar free help. Extra, the only leading sugar free help with future sweet gives you extra refreshing flavor that lasts an extra, extra, extra long time. Man, it's a uh, March episode R of the Ninja on the Color podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars, give us four stars, give us three stars, give us two stars, give us any stars. I'll just assume that I'm doing it perfect. Uh, we are available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Samsung Podcast, Pandora, Google Podcast, and TuneIn. Yes, we're still working on Apple. As of this moment, it is 6.34 p.m. We still have second round games going on. And for the tournament, it's okay. It's parity. But we have had a couple of upsets. Kansas is out. Again, a number one seed. And for a side note, the NCAA owes for a state a championship because of COVID. But we will... I need to do that right now. That's a fine. Uh, two times. Two times in NCAA history. A 16 has upset a 1 seed. It was five years ago. And again this year. FDU upset number one seeded Purdue. Let's go to the highlights.
for the Boilermakers. Gets the turn at the line. Grabbing the draw right here on Columbus. Shot clock at eight. Singleton to the rim. Yep, a 16 bit of one. Um, that shows that um, the coach didn't adjust well. Because what they were doing was packing the paint so the big guy couldn't. The big guy couldn't score. And what happened was they allowed their, their guards. Your guards to shoot, and my guards got cold. That's how it was. Uh, now the stigma is that dude, that coach for um, what's his name uh, for Purdue is not a winner, but he should have adjusted to the game stock because they were pressing in, and they they sped the game up. Purdue is a slow down, back and down game, but that's what happens when you don't adjust. Uh, again, it is March Madness, men's and women's, and all we show is, all we see is that the field is wide open. Uh, I pick Houston to win. Uh, they are in the Sweet 16. Um, it's going to be Houston versus Alabama unless a major injury comes about, because Sasser was hurt during the, the AAC Concert Championship, but he came back good today. So let's listen to our highlights of the second round. Welcome to the second round of the NCAA tournament. The making of the madness moments is what we so enjoy. You know there are going to be surprises. You just don't know what to Remember that 618 field we started with? It's now down to 32. And at the end of the day, that Sweet 16 is going to be set. The round of 32. The 13th seed. From Empowerment. Take out the 15th San Diego State Aztecs. The whole rope just dropped that ball of 18. And 18 to 1 run for San Diego State. That was domination at both ends. And the Aztecs are going to the Sweet 16. We might have the team to beat us. We'll tip our hats to them. But right now, that team, we haven't seen that team. It's the first ever tournament meeting between Duke and Tennessee. This was something to watch.
Your bracket busted. Mine is. Purdue messed it up. Kansas messed it up. All the higher seeds that lost messed it up. So, again, I'm going to Houston. Hopefully, no injuries. It'll be Houston versus Alabama. And then Houston will cut down the nets. VI Pride. All right. Moving on to the women's tournament. There's only one team. It's South Carolina versus the field. And guess what? South Carolina is going to repeat as national champs, so check it out. Carolina has won 39 games in a row on the hunt for back-to-back national titles, and one of the greatest to wear a South Carolina uniform is playing one more time in Columbia. Thank you. 
to that day. Green Bay are still on the same increases. One of the things South Florida does is they find action with a lot of screens. And they on Johansson, and she is able to get her feet set and knock that down. They won the American Conference Bowl of Season Championship in the summertime. the NCAA tournament, Aaron Wilson had made 13 field goals. Jose Fernandez has left her on the floor and she has been able to stay. That's the 32 of the official leader trying to get around the Johansson. So for two offices. Between these two guards, one point points are hard to
possession. It's trying to force South Carolina to turn the ball over. Eight minutes of all points for South Florida. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> the South Carolina Gamecocks will repeat as national champs, even if they have an injury. I don't think they will. Knock on wood. Hopefully not. And I don't really follow women's basketball like that, but I only see probably th two to three teams that can they can probably beat them. Uh, number three, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Number two, the Yukon Huskies. And number one, Stanford Cardinals. Stanford is the one that can beat them because they can match them with size. Size and rebounding. Other than that, no other team could probably do it. Uh, Yukon is not at full strength, and I only have the one player. I said they have two. They have a guard and a forward, so... They could probably stop with defense. All right, this is the Ninja of Another Color podcast. I'm your host, D O T T L E Y. Uh, rate us, review us, subscribe, comment, give us feedback, give us five stars, give us four stars, give us three stars, give us two stars, give us any stars. I'll just assume if you don't give us any stars, I'll assume that I'm doing it, doing it correctly. We are available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Samsung Podcasts. Pandora, Google Podcast, TuneIn, yes, we're still working on Apple, yes, yes, Apple, moving on to our next, the next topic, the NFL, um, right now the Falcons are at 24 and a half million from 66, they signed some, I guess, top tier or me medium free agents. Jesse Bates was the highest paid. Um, they re-signed uh, McGarry. They added a couple of Saints players. But uh, they got $24 million left over. Let's see what NFL that we're talking about. Number eight pick. Maybe we thought quarterback might have been in play for them earlier this offseason. I don't know if that's the case anymore. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, quarterback offensive tackle. You know, because Caleb McGarry, their right tackle, was a free agent. They let him test the market. Then they end up re-signing McGarry to pair next to Chris Lindstrom, the right guard, that right side that was so effective last year. They paid Lindstrom a long extension. But as we know, this is a team now, by re-signing those guys, going out and getting Jesse Bates at safety, then adding some linebacker help uh, with Ellis coming over from the Saints and David Onmiyata, defensive tackle from the Saints, I hate saying this about a top 10 team because I always believe that it's a myth, 
But now with a team of the eight pick, they can take the best player available, whether it's an edge player, whether it's a corner. So they go back to the wide receiver well, but what they did in free agency has allowed them that free, that, that option to even possibly trade back and address those same positions. So you saw what they did in free agency and how it impacts the draft and how they've tried to shape this team over the past couple of years to build around their quarterback, whether it be Ritter or whether it be somebody else as they move forward. You know, I've been surprised because they haven't spent at quarterback. They're a team that hasn't been mentioned enough as a candidate for some of these receivers we talked about. So when you're looking at the potential trade market for some of the bigger names or maybe even an OBJ landing spot, to me Atlanta would make sense because they've saved that cap space by not spending at quarterback. I'm just curious, uh, Steve, you know this team as well as anyone. You really think they would pass on a quarterback at eight if one of these four? If one of those four drops, they're going to think about it. I I will say that, especially a guy like Richardson, whose skill set fits what they like to do with that mobile pocket, can run the ball. It's got to be something that they think about, but I think that's also where they dangle that carrot to see if some team wants to come up. Terry Fontenot, Arthur Smith seem to be building things in the right direction for Atlanta. Let's stay in the state of Georgia. Georgia, Jalen Carter. At one time, Jim thought to be maybe the number one overall pick. The big defensive tackle from Georgia has gotten into some off-field trouble here of late. What are you hearing about his future? Yeah, you know, I talked to um, some personnel people at the draft about him when the story initially broke about this this drag racing incident. And they said they didn't see a way, unless he were arrested and to serve time, that he would fall out of the top ten. After his pro day, I reached out to some of these same people, and the response was not the same. The response now is, we have some concerns. And you can use whatever words you want to use, whether it's character or whatever, but the one word I heard from one executive yesterday was professionalism. Pro Day is a job interview. For him not to be able to finish the drills says to them, how professional are you? So look, he's a guy that initially was talked about as possibly being a number one pick overall. And now there is an opportunity. He may fall out of the top ten. So is there a team out there that may say, we think we can get through to him because of his talent? And the word that was used by personnel people was special in terms of talking about his ability. Do these other things now push him down? And the opinion of of these personnel people has changed. So it's going to be interesting what happens with him. I I agree, Joe. Look, he he added nine pounds from the combine to his pro day. That's usually where guys really come in more fit, especially when they don't perform at the combine, which we know he didn't do all the drills there. I think one thing that's also going to be very important to him in the interviews, and besides some of the off-field stuff, is where is he mentally? I mean, he's a young man who was drag racing where a teammate and another staffer from the University of Georgia died. I mean, that's a tough thing to have to cope with at any age, at any maturity level. You know, where is he, you know, does he need help with that? I mean, I just think of myself at that age, you know, I mean, that that's going to weigh on me a little bit. So I just, I, I would hope these teams are really kind of checking on his mental health. Right, I'm glad you brought that up because Jalen Carter is going through so much off the field. Right. And how can he handle that while also being in the spotlight of the potential number one overall pick? You would think... It's difficult to ascertain what this young man's future is going to be, but that isn't just a decision about bringing him right now and where he is right now. Where can he be in the next four years? And so many evaluators say it's about the tape. And we see NFL teams talk about character, and then they trade and give a guaranteed contract to Deshaun Watson. So I have a hard time believing that a man this talented uh, who's making mistakes and maybe not acting mature at at this age, that they aren't going to see a way uh, to bring him into their building and still give him uh, the opportunity that he wants, probably towards the top of the draft because he's the number one uh, talent in the draft. I'm just telling you, the people I talked to loved him at the Combine. And so to hear them flip now and say, Mm -hmm. we have some concerns, I'm not in any way saying he falls out of the top ten. I'm not in any way saying he falls out of the first round. I'm just saying to you, these same people have concerns. And I'm saying, I think to Greg's point, they now have 41 days to talk themselves back into it with that kind of talent. We heard you mention Odell Beckham Jr. with the Falcons talk. We saw Odell tweeting with Saquon Barkley yesterday. Hey, go tell Joe, Joe Shane, the Giants general manager, give my agent a call, man. What do you make of the Giants need that receiver here, Greg? You know, they're putting it out that they're not going to be spending big at wide receiver. They made their wide receiver moves in free agency, and that's Paris. We started the show. All right. You heard from NFL Network. Will the Falcons 
take a chance on Jalen Carter. Will they? I think they should. They need an edge rusher, but is he big enough to play edge? Or is he a run stuffer? Uh, who knows? But I think they should give him a shot to to play. And that's one thing that if they give him a shot to play, maybe the off the field issues would subside. He'd be a top ten. He had top ten talent, but he was drag racing, so I don't know. Give him a shot. Okay, the elephant in the room. Would you trade for, or would you give up two draft picks for Lamar Jackson? As a Falcons fan, no, because there's no guarantee that our defense is good yet. We're making strides on defense, but hey. We need to address the concerns on defense first, and he should either stay with them or go with the Carolina Panthers. But check us out. A lot of time of news to report on this situation. Other teams are free to negotiate with him, make an offer sheet that the Ravens would then have the right to match because he is their franchise player on the non-exclusive franchise tag. At this point, Greeny, I think there will be interested teams. There are teams pondering a Lamar Jackson pursuit, but no one has sort of formalized that yet. Uh, we're early in the process. My understanding, though, of people I've talked to close to the situation, is that Lamar is not thrilled about the franchise tag, and that he's interested to find out what these other teams have to say. So I think this is a process where we will start to hear things in the coming weeks about who might be interested and at what level and how realistic it is. Yeah, and of course, the really big question is, does it all result in Lamar Jackson no longer being on the Baltimore Ravens? Yesterday, here on the show, we had his former teammate, Orlando Brown Jr., who began his career with Baltimore and then went to Kansas City and now has gone to Cincinnati. But we were talking to him about this Lamar situation and the guaranteed money piece of it, and he had a really interesting comment. Here's what he said. At this point in time in the NFL, I do believe that fully guaranteed contracts should definitely be something that we're discussing. And someone like Lamar, his status, his ability, things that he's shown as a leader, his qualities off the field, I don't know if there's anybody more deserving right now than that, than him. You know what I mean? Maybe some other quarterbacks that are coming up, but I would personally believe he definitely deserves fully guaranteed due. Okay, so he said that. We posted that clip. We, we, we clipped off that conversation and we put it on Twitter. Lamar Jackson saw it, and he retweeted it, or, and, or quote tweeted, I should say, and he wrote, first off, drip, congratulations, two times, Big Bra, and then he wrote, when this is all said and done, I feel bad for the rest of the 31, hashtag, not really, and with the emojis, Chris Canty, help me interpret that, because it... That could mean a lot of different things. I'm trying to decide if he's saying, man, when the Ravens and I work this out, I feel sorry for everybody else. Or is he saying, man, when I figure out where I'm going to be this year, that I, I, I'm trying to interpret that message. How did you Well, let me help you out. It's the latter. It's not the former. Because it's not about the Baltimore Ravens. It's about the team that's willing to give him a fully guaranteed contract uh -huh. or damn close to it. And if I'm Lamar Jackson, I'm digging in. There's no incentive for me to sign the franchise tag or to sign whatever deal that the Baltimore Ravens are putting out there unless there's a team that comes to the table with the fully guaranteed contract. I'm going to sit down in South Beach and put my shoulders up, put my feet up, and wait. Because the one thing we know about the NFL is that this is a quarterback star league. There are never enough quality quarterbacks to go around. And whether it happens throughout this all season or whether it happens during the regular season, somebody's current plan on quarterback is going to get blown up due to skill or injury. And Lamar Jackson is going to be an option for them at the level in terms of the compensation that he's looking for. So if you're Lamar, you've already won. You, your body of work speaks for itself. It's just a matter of waiting until the team steps up with the offer you feel you deserve. I hear what you're saying. But there are so many teams in the NFL whose current quarterback plan isn't nearly as good as getting a oh, job. Jackson. So I get it that someone someone's plan will blow up. But there are already many teams whose plans would be way better if Lamar Jackson was their quarterback. And to our knowledge, no one is knocking on that door yet, right? Right. And again, it's early in the process. It's a complicated process because it's not just signing Lamar Jackson as a free agent. You, you negotiate, you can make an offer sheet, and then you could still end up not getting him because the Baltimore Ravens could just match your offer sheet. Right. So I think teams are kind of 
you know, setting their chess boards. Like, what would this mean? What would it cost? What else would we have to do in terms of personnel, in terms of coaching, all that kind of stuff? So I, I do think it's early. Teams, teams have more pressing concerns right now in free agency because I don't think there's an urgency on this. Like, if we found out somebody was in on it, all of a sudden other interested teams might get a move on. But to this point, it's the kind of thing that they can continue to plan around and, and sort of plan their, their uh their you know, Nico, I, I go back in time here. I, I want to say it was two years ago, right when you first started coming on with us regularly. Uh, it, it struck me how big a fan of Lamar Jackson you were. So to, to be just to sort of set the table with that, you were the one telling us that if you gave Lamar Jackson the opportunities that Patrick Mahomes has had and that kind of offer, you thought that Lamar would be the best player in the league. I, I remember sitting here and hearing you say that. So just sort of establishing that as your opinion, what is your sense of what's happening now? Should some team be willing to do all the things it's going to take right now to get Lamar Jackson as their quarterback? Yeah, no, Greeny, I, I have been on Lamar's side basically since he was drafted. When he was drafted, I thought that he was going to be the best quarterback of the group. And, you know, he hasn't let me down. The MVP season, I, again, it speaks for itself. His performance speaks for itself. Now, at this point right now, I'm with Canty. If you are Lamar, you're digging in. And, and, and the Ravens, if they're not going to give Lamar what he wants, then you got to dig in and you got to hold out. Um, and if you're another football team, I don't know, like the Patriots. If you're the Patriots and you go and you make an attempt to get Lamar, that changes everything, absolutely everything. And listen, I am a huge fan of just Lamar's style of game and what it puts on a defense, the stresses. And there's needs and wants, okay? A need is necessary for life. A want, it helps, it helps your quality of life. I don't need Lamar here, but I sure as heck want to see Lamar running around with a with a New England Patriot on his helmet. Because if I if you see it out there, the Patriots instantly, instantly become division favorites, and to me, get right back into that Super Bowl hunt. Could you imagine a division that had oh my goodness Aaron Rodgers, Josh Allen, Tua? And Lamar Jackson, and I mean that would be remarkable. To be clear, we haven't heard any rumblings about New England being involved in this, and they did no, just take. I would, but I would not rule it out. But I, but I will say this: Bill Belichick has a pension for going out and yeah. getting players that he struggled to defend. Yeah, uh, on other teams. And they're thinking about that in New England. We got to compete against Aaron Rodgers. Like, yeah. that, that oh yeah, much much like, less of the no doubt about it. <laughs> we will see. That might bring another championship to that region. Speaking of which, the Boston Bruins are going to get. A- all right, would you change your entire offense to get Lamar Jackson with no guarantee you'll make the Super Bowl? Again, I don't think I would. The Falcons need so much more to show up before they get a good quarterback, and I think they already have a good quarterback. And they do have a good quarterback, not a great quarterback, but a good quarterback who is serviceable. Just, I always say, protect the quarterback and you be good to go just protect us protect them you'll be good to go um, um, on that front moving on the NBA playoffs is coming but we saw a clip of John Morant and Jalen Rose talking to people And we're trying to figure out, was he schooled or is he ready to be put under pressure? All right, check this out. Jalen Rose earlier today, their conversation is new here on Sports Center. You're 23 years old. You're a superstar. You're one of the faces of the NBA. What has the last 10 or 11 days been like for you? And how are you doing? Uh, me personally, um, I feel... Mentally good, and I haven't, you know, been in, you know, many years. I'm in a space where I'm, you know, very comfortable. I was constantly, you know, talking to therapists. Um, I've been doing, you know, reiki treatment. Um, I'm doing anxiety breathing, you know, different stuff to, you know, help me manage that and, you know, release, you know, all that stuff from my body. When did you say I'm gonna do this and it's necessary? I made a, you know, terrible mistake, you know, being inside. Um, a club and, you know, went live. 
Um, I put myself in, you know, a bad position. Um, and also, it's, you know, my daughter. Mm, it sounds where she even tell me if she's, you know, had a bad day. And you know, I feel like, you know, if she can tell me that, then, you know, I can be able to go and talk to somebody as well. You at the spot, Shotgun Willie. You are holding a gun. And we both know how dangerous that can be. Whose gun were you holding? Well, the gun wasn't mine. Uh -huh. No, it's not who I am. I don't condone and, you know, any type of violence. Um, but I take, you know, full responsibility, you know, for my actions. Um, made a you know, bad mistake. Um, and I can see uh, the image, you know, that I painted, you know, over myself, you know, with my recent mistakes. But, you know, in the future, uh, I'm going to show everybody who John really is, you know, what I'm about, and, um, you know, change this narrative. John has missed the Grizzlies' last five games, all of which will count towards his suspension, meaning that he's eligible to return on Monday when Memphis hosts Dallas. All right. He's speaking about himself in the third person. Is that not a sign of not being healthy? And he's 23. What is he trying to prove? I don't understand. He got eight games, and he's coming back for the playoffs. Is he going to snap again? Talking to the therapist, I don't know, but hey, he did the rehearsed screen thing very well, and I guess he passed the test when he talked to the commissioner that he got eight games. They couldn't prove that the, the gun was, he brought the gun on the plane or in a, a, a plane or got, uh, got it in the locker room or anything like that, so. I'm pulling for the kid, but I think this was a PR, PR, um, what's it called? Scrubbing or putting from the cameras to make sure he's alright so he can get a statement. But we're pulling for the kid, but they're not making, they're going to make the playoffs, but they're not going to win the championship this year. They might win it the next year, but they're not going to win it this year. Alright, moving on. If you're not watching the World Baseball Classic, then you're not a true baseball fan because the United States are playing Cuba right now to go to the finals, I think on Tuesday? Yeah, on Tuesday will be the finals. But last night they were against Venezuela, our guy Ron Lacuna Jr., and came back to win in dramatic fashion but at least our guy Ronald had one for two drove in a run and he'll be back but right now let's check it out if we get set for the United States and Venezuela which is victory over Colombia lost the first pitch
That was quarterfinal action between the United States and Venezuela. And yep, the United States came from behind, hitting the grand slam by our sworn, uh, I guess he's our enemy, Trey Turner, coming up at the World Baseball Classic. Has been marked with exciting plays and also injuries. Altuve broke his thumb. I think Freddie Freeman has a hamstring injury. And Mets closer. Oh, God, I forgot his name. Yeah, the Mets closer uh, has seizing ending surgery. Oops, but as a brave fan, guess what happened? Ronald Acuna Jr. looks like he's back, and he came back. He's coming back to the team healthy, so... As tribute to him surviving the World Baseball Classic, here are expectations from number 13, Ronald Acuna Jr. Jr., who walked away over at the Harvard Baseball Classic. You, know, you said friend. there were some other names in there? Yes, sir. Maybe not to qualify with his talent, though. Yeah, no, no, no. That's just being fair. Well, uh, absolutely. No disrespect to the other names. And remember what but we dis- saw. But disrespect. Remember we saw him in 2019 at, at the Home Run Derby with he and Lappin on the show. And he just had that easy groove to write for you. Know, I mean, you don't see many guys go oppo in Home Run Derbies. This dude was foul pole to foul pole in the Home Run Derby, which you don't see. So, special type of pa- uh, talent, special type of pop. I mean, and he's still putting on display. All right, Cam, so what happened then last year? Hit 266 at 15 bombs. Still, still at 29 stolen bases, but he wasn't quite the guy that we had seen a couple years back, and obviously he had the ACL injury that took place back in 2021. Well, first off, guys would love to have those numbers on a down year. Okay, this guy's coming back off of a major injury, a major surgery when we talk about ACL repair. That's almost... You know, that's essentially full reconstruction of the knee. I yep. mean, so this is a guy who I saw come back a little bit too fast. 24, won't be 25 until mid-December this year. Wow. This is a young guy who I think at times was a little bit overzealous, a little anxious, wanting to get back in the mix, watching this group of young, talented guys that he has around him. I think he was just a little eager to get back. So what you saw was a guy who just didn't quite have his legs up under him. You saw Snit have to really kind of manage his time on the field, kind of manage how he plays. You know, he's a wild horse out there. He's all, all all open. He's going to lead it out, out on the field each day. So I think now with him having an opportunity to have all season, getting healthy, getting strong, you see him right there. His legs are up under him in a home run derby. To have that many homers in a home run derby, you have to have your legs up under you. It's good to see. I see him being right back to the guy that we saw a few years ago, dominant possible uh, NL MVP race right. type, of, type of player. And he's fun to watch. My favorite guy in the, in the game to watch when he's healthy. Yeah, here's the deal. We, we spent some time. We've talked about Jose Ubre that the Astros just got. Yep. And he posts every single day. And for whatever reason, it might not be his fault, he hasn't been out there 150 plus times but once. And here's the scary truth about that, what the Braves want. Now, they don't need 162 out of him, but his 162 game average, 38 homers. Yep. 34 stolen bases, 124 runs scored. That's his 162 game average. So the Braves are sitting there going, I agree with you. He leaves it on, he plays hard, he's borderline reckless at times. How do we curve that a little bit? Like Bryce Harper. 
Yes, but uh, get him out there on the field 150 plus times. Because if he gets out there on the field 150 plus times, we're looking at the Braves as the possible NL type favorite to advance on deep into postseason. So that's kind of the the predicament that they're in. Because I love the way he plays. He plays hard. Yep. He busts it. He'll run into a wall. He does those things. But how do we harness that to get him on the field 150 plus times? Yeah, you see Mike Trout. Mike Trout also is a guy who's done it. I mean, a guy that came in, we know he can get 40, 50 bags a year. He's calmed down. He's backed off a little bit because he understands that being available is more important than those numbers per se. Trying to you know add on the stolen bases and things like that. So how can you stay on the field is going to be key for him. Like you said, how do you harness it without taking away who he truly is? So let me ask you this, Cam. Do you think there's a part of him that uh, that still just plucks him a little bit? They won the World Series without him. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But even when you look at that. They won it without him, but I always look at it like this. They wouldn't have been there without him. Correct. He did a lot during that season yep. to help put them and propel yep. them into a position to where they were that year as well because they made a little run at the end, and you, you have to know that he was a big part of that run before he got injured. But, so, but do you think it drives him? Oh, 100%. 100%. 100%. He, drives. he wants to be a driving force. And when we look at him this year, you can't tell me he's not going, man, if I was in that lineup healthy. What could we have been? What could we have done? They missed, they missed some offense reduction with him being a little bit banged up, going down a stretch line. So I'm sure he's very much motivated. You see right here, he's not doing things like this if he's not motivated and trying to get back on the field and being that special type of player that he really is. Right, he's in a position to say, what about now? I'm good. He is in a position to do that. And he says, no, I want to get there because I want to get right again. And this helps him get right. So what, what we missed, what the game misses when he's not on the field is one of the most unbelievable talents we've seen in a long time. It, it, it's really true because those 162-game average numbers, that's 38 bombs and 34 bags. I mean, he could be a realistic 40-40 guy without pushing the envelope too much because he's got that much talent. And one of the things I think you know works well in the Braves' favor, and I love the Braves' coaching staff because, in effect, you have four managers. you got Walt Weiss, you got Eric Young, you've got, uh, obviously, Brian Snicker and also Ryan Washington. And so, you know, Acuna said some things when Freddie Freeman was gone, and there was a little bit of friction there uh, based on that old school, new school. There's enough managerial talent in that locker room where, they, like you said, they can harness, you know, the energy and the love that he plays with, but then also make it fit for the Braves. I can't wait to see what he does this year. Well, I think now, too. Freddie Freeman's not there anymore. That's right. He's the most talented player in that locker room. Yep. It's his team now. Yep. So you got a group of young guys, Vaughn Grissom, uh, Albies. There's a youthful energy about that clubhouse now. So I don't think that's going to bother them as much as you know, some of the things that he does on the baseball field because you've got a lot of young guys, and it's it's that whole let the kids play time. So they're going to have a little bit more. It can't be his team, though, unless he's out there. Oh, that's true. Time. Absolutely. Because you know what? The other dude's playing. The other dude's playing. Absolutely. Play Absolutely. Right, great points. Great points. And you guys sent in your best videos. And, I and again... I think he'll be a 40-40 guy. He'll be a real 40-40 guy. And hopefully the Braves, will, again, will win a championship with him at the top of the lineup. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Ninja's Red on the Color Podcast. I am your host, D-O-T-T-L-E-Y. Rate us, review us, subscribe, follow, it's free. Give us five stars, give us four stars, give us three stars, give us two stars. Give us any amount of stars because if you don't, I'll just assume I'm doing it correctly. We are available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Samsung Podcasts, Pandora, Google Podcasts, tune in, yes, and we're still, yes, we are still absolutely working to get on Apple Podcasts. And as of now, we will see you on the next episode. Good night.